your voice in the future when you are no longer able to communicate. Now I want you to meet our experts, and they're going to discuss this. First, from a legal point of view, to my left, attorney Bill Barker, and from the hospital's point of view, Sue Beer Gibson, who is the patient representative at Children's Hospital. Welcome to both of you. Sue, first question, because now I think this is a new term that, that uh, maybe a lot of people aren't even familiar with yet. Advanced directive, what is it? Okay, Eleanor, very simply stated, an advanced directive is a written document that allows you to um, outline what types of treatment you would or would not want should you become incapacitated or unable to speak for yourself and if you were either terminally ill or permanently unconscious. It's the type of thing, it's decisions that have been talked about before but only when a crisis occurs. Advanced directives allow you to determine those decisions before the crisis occurs. Are there different types of, of advanced directives or is there just one? There are many different types. Um, the, the law that you referred to, the Patient Self-Determination Act, um, it requires hospitals to inform patients of their rights under the state law. So they vary from state to state. Um, in addition to that, there are um, what is commonly called living wills, but in the state of Pennsylvania, I believe it's called a Declaration for Health Care or an advanced, advanced directive for health care, um, which allows you to determine specific types of treatment you would or wouldn't want, or declare a surrogate decision maker. What is li a living will? Is this one and the same? This is, uh, an advanced directive is just a new term for what used to be called a living, a living will. will. Okay, let's get down to the law now. We now have a law in the books. I, I just saw recently that all 50 states have advanced directive laws. Ours went into effect in April. What does it say, Bill? Well, in April this year, we were the 49th state to enact an advanced directive statute. Uh, just as it, so some of our viewers might be interested in, in understanding, living wills is, is the old term. And the reason we're not using that and, and you don't want to use that in, anymore is people confuse that with their last will and testament. What we're talking about tonight, this advanced directive, is only a document that has any value while someone's alive. Your last will is a document that takes effect after someone's died. So that's why the new term, it's an advanced directive. You're giving your doctors in advance directions as to what medical care you would want. Now what the statute does is, is it set forth a very high threshold for when this piece of paper comes into effect. Now, when does it go into it effect? It comes into effect if two things occur. One is that you are incompetent, so you are not capable of relaying your decision to the doctor. If you, if you can say yes or no to treatment, this piece of paper, the advanced directive, has no meaning. Your decision... Now, does this mean you must be comatose? You must be unconscious? It means unable you're not, you are unable to communicate your wishes for whatever reason. Uh, and then secondly, you must be suffering either from a terminal illness for which there's no known cure or you were in a state of permanent unconsciousness. No hope for recovery. Exactly. I mean, the statute's very, very clear that this in no way is to encourage euthanasia or mercy killing. It is only to come into play at the very late last stages when medical technology has now surpassed our ethics and the law. This piece of paper, the advanced directive, now comes into play. Then my definition was all right. It, it's your voice in the future when, when you are unable to speak. I exactly. think that's a fine definition. What is durable power of attorney? I, I see that popping up in, in the literature that you gave me to read. Okay, a durable power of attorney is one way you could also have someone make medical decisions for you. But a durable power of attorney is you transfer your ability to enter into legal actions. You appoint an attorney, in fact, family member or a friend. And you say in that piece of paper that this power will continue on even if I become incapacitated. So that's where the durable aspect comes in. Who do you give that durable power of attorney to? Uh, that one's a difficult question. The durable power of attorney, I recommend to my clients that they keep that to themselves because with the durable power of attorney, if it's a general power of attorney, who you give it to, they could go out and sell your house or they could mm -hmm. take everything out of your bank accounts. If you're only concerned about health care, you can have what's called a health care proxy which is basically a durable power of attorney, which is limited to health care decisions. There you would be appointing someone, a friend, family member, to 
make your health care decisions for you. Um, that can work in conjunction with your advanced directives so that there is somebody who can actually, you haven't fully reached the stage, the threshold stages, so maybe you're not able to make your decision. You can't communicate to the doctor what you would want, but you're not suffering from a real terminal illness. This other person then could tell the doctors what they should do. Okay, this is something that we have to think about. Even though we don't want to, we have to think about. We have to think about, and I'm, I'm now looking at, at the viewer because I'm sure that maybe you're sitting right now in your living room and saying, you know, let's turn this program off. I don't want to think about whether I want to be kept alive with extraordinary measures. Uh, let's, let's turn the sitcom on. You stay with us because I think we all, I'm going to deal with it tonight. I didn't even want to do this show, but I'm going to deal with it tonight. And we're going to come back and we're going to talk about the things that you really need to think about. Our phone lines are open. We have two experts in the studio to discuss advanced directives. 622-1555. Come back and we're going to continue our conversation. Everyone has something to say about American foreign policy, energy, and family values. Join the National Press Club as it hears all this and more in a Public Voice 92. The United Nations must stand with those who seek greater freedom and democracy. The cost of being the solo superpower policeman is ridiculously prohibitive. We keep talking about the freedom of the one that expresses, but I'd also like to be free from having to be expressed too. Now that is the belief of the American people. Don't miss a Public Voice 92, Tuesday night at 8, only on WQEX 16. The Wright brothers opened up a new frontier with their historical flight in 1903. Little did they know where pioneers would boldly go with their creation. Wings Over the World profiles the dreams and accomplishments of the men determined to be upwardly mobile. Meet the designers who struggled to change aviation history in war and peace. Wings Over the World. Weekly. I'm Eleanor Shano, and tonight we're talking about advanced directives. Uh, what do you want to be used in, in the event uh, of your becoming incompetent, comatose? What extraordinary means you would want your physician, your health care provider to use? Are physicians and are hospitals legally bound now, once you have this, this, this document, are they legally bound to implement your wishes? Yes, if the document is put on record, in fact, one of the places, you, once you decide you're going to sign one of these documents, when you sign it, one of the first places you should take it to is your doctor. Of course, we should probably step back and say, when you decide to sign this, you should really discuss this with your doctor beforehand. Okay. Because that's who's going to be able to give okay. you the medical advice that you need to make a knowledgeable decision as to what you want. We have a caller on line five. Go ahead, you're on the air. Uh, yes, my question is, um, a very young person, and I believe in the quality of life being much more important than the quantity thereof. So if I go in for surgery during a normal routine, you know, low risk surgical procedure. An appendectomy, something like that. Okay. And I have an advanced directive that says I do not want extraordinary measures. I do not want to be on a respirator or any other types of life supports. I know that during a surgical procedure, things would have to be done in order to try and, you know, get me through the surgery. But if I cannot be withdrawn from them after the operation, would my advanced directive allow these extraordinary measures that were used against my will to be withdrawn? I think that's an excellent question. Um, I think it's important to remember what Bill referred to as the threshold, that your advanced directive only becomes effective if you are permanently unconscious or terminally ill. Now, the, the extraordinary measures used to resuscitate you in the operating room would not violate your advanced directive. However, should it become evident, let's say a week, two weeks later, that you were in a permanent unconscious state, then your advanced directive would go into effect and those um, life-sustaining um, treatments could be withdrawn at that point. Now, we're talking about 
what kind of extraordinary measures? We're, we're talking about uh, nourishment. Uh, what else? Well, it can be the, the statute, actually, the Pennsylvania statute provides a, a checkoff list of various procedures that they're talking you about. you have that in your head? I, mean, um, can you, can I you have some of them. If not, I'll cheat and look at the, okay. uh, the paper. Uh, but the form starts off with, with asking whether you would or, want, would or would not want cardiac resuscitation. So if, cardiac resuscitation, now that, that's pretty basic. Right, if your heart stops beating, right. the doctors can come in and get it started again. Right. Do you want okay. that or not? Um, and then it goes down to... Feeding tubes. Feed tubes and hydration, that's a very right. good, difficult one. But then it goes to the question, would you want any invasive procedures to see if there's anything else wrong with you? So you're suffering from late stage cancer, for which there's no known cure, and you're developing pneumonia. It's rather easy to treat the pneumonia. In the advanced directive, you could say that you don't want any, any antibiotics. Mm -hmm. So if you begin to develop then a pneumonia, depending upon what you would want to say in your advanced directive, the doctors either would or wouldn't treat the other disease, which would then become the immediate cause of death. Now, Bill, the critics of this law say that it doesn't go far enough because it really doesn't cover, say, the Alzheimer patient. That, that patient is not considered terminally ill. Uh, this statute, as I said earlier, is not in any way to be interpreted as encouraging euthanasia or mercy killing. Uh, this is a, merely a statute that says we have a, li a qualified right to make decisions about our medical treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, but we as a society have other values, and it's, it's those other values that come into play with saying... Sue, I think it's important to, to uh, mention at this point that this is not just for seniors. It's just no, not for no. the elderly. You are a young woman. You have an advanced directive. Now, take us through what you have done with yours. Who has a copy of yours, for example? Who have you discussed this with? Well, first of all, I discussed it with my family because I think it's very important that your family understand not only what your decisions are, but why you feel that way. Whether it's that you don't, uh, you feel very strongly about not being kept alive by artificial means, whether it has to do with not wanting your economic resources depleted, whether it's quality of life. They need to understand so that in the event that that advanced directive becomes um, uh, in effect, they're not going to feel any resentment at, at your health care provider for implementing it. So I've discussed it with my family, my, my personal physician. It's a part of my permanent medical record. When you, when, as you mentioned in the beginning of the show, any time you go to the hospital, for whatever reason now, if you are an adult as defined by the state of Pennsylvania, they are going to ask you, do you have an advanced directive? They're required then to document the presence of that advanced directive in your medical record. My, my advanced directive is a part of my permanent medical record. My lawyer has a copy, my best friend and my sister. Okay. We have a caller on line six. Go ahead. You're on the air. Hi. Yes, I have two quick questions. Where do I get an advanced directive? And does this also take the place of a living will? Because I have a living will for my mother now. Okay, if, if I could take those. I'll take the second question first. Uh, an advanced directive is, again, just a new term for a living will. So if your mother has already signed a living will, that should be valid. She doesn't um, need, then, she, another document. No, if, if she already has the, the previous will. What you might want to review it for is to see if it, if it really provides the guidance that's needed. Um, in the past, living wills used to say, I don't want heroic measures heroic measures doesn't provide much guidance mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's whereas this have, document really spells it out in a b c d uh, becomes very very specific uh, um, and you can go through the checklist right yes in fact on the form that's in the statute you, you have to go through the checklist mm -hmm. you you say you do or do not want the cardiac resuscitation i do or do not want invasive procedures i do or do not want blood products mm -hmm. Uh, that, that you have to do if you're filling out the form that's provided in the statute. Now, uh, to the first question you had, um, you could get the, fo the form probably now is available in, in a number of stationary stores. It's been around now since April, uh, so you could try to get a form there. Obviously, you could go to an attorney who would have the form. Um, the hospitals would... Many Are the hospitals, the hospitals providing to the hospitals, them? They will have. Just call. It's a choice the hospital can make, and, and uh, some hospitals are providing it, some are not. Um, some are simply recommending that uh, the person contact uh, the Area Agency on Aging, a local library. We are required to refer them to a, a source for the form if they request it. 
We're going to continue our conversation tonight on advanced directives. Uh, I want to remind you again, our phone lines are open. Our number is 622-1555. When we come back, we're going to talk a little more specifically about how you can go about having an advanced directive and uh, where you can not only find the forms, but whether you can draw it up, whether you need an attorney, how much it costs, etc. So we'll be right back right after these messages. Uh, do you need an attorney? I'm Norma Zimmer, and I'm going to be your guest hostess. Here are some highlights from the show. I saw the light, I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Underwritten on WQEX by Canterbury Place. Saturday night, venture on the highways and byways of America, at least the ones on water. Jason Robards narrates this journey of the Driftwood, a boat that logged over 25,000 miles from Liberty Island to the St. Lawrence Seaway, from the Mississippi River to Florida's Gulf Coast. Meet the people whose lives depend on the canals, rivers, and lakes of North America. Saturday night at 8, sail with QEX as we discover America on the waterways. Welcome back to HY's Weekly. Our phone number is 622-1555. Let's go through now the legal mechanics of advanced directives. Uh, you said that you can maybe get a form in a stationery store, maybe you can get one at a hospital. Do you need a form? Can you just write it out tonight uh, in, in your own handwriting and uh, would that be legally binding? Well, you, you could write it out yourself and it would be legally binding if it in Pennsylvania if it's signed and if it's witnessed by two people who signed are also and 18 by two people. and competent. Okay. okay. But I would not recommend Does it have to be notarized? Down. It does not have to be notarized. There's no requirement in the statute. It doesn't hurt it to be notarized, but there's no requirement that it be notarized. Um, I think one point that's that's important to tell our viewers is that once the advance directive is signed, it is it acts on its own. You, know, you do not need to appoint a person to carry that out. The, the, the directives, if they're put in your file, as Sue said, she has hers in her, her medical file, her doctor would have the ability to look at that, mm -hmm. and the doctor would then make the decision at that point. The family it is not, there is no need to appoint another person. Should you keep a copy of this in your home? Uh, what, what if the paramedics are called at, at 3 o'clock in the morning? Well, I always recommend that you keep it at home and that you keep it in a fairly a place where it will be found. Again, this, this document's unlike your last will and testament, that you don't want anybody to know what's in it or there's no need for you. Uh, all right, now, now you, you don't need an attorney then, right? No, draw this out. Th there's really no, no need. You need more medical consultation. I, I've had, and I'll tell you this story, in my practice happens all the time. People call me up and say, I want to sign one of those living wills. And I say, well, they're not called living wills. They're advanced declarations, but come in and talk about it. No, no, just send the form to me. No, I think you need to come in. Finally, I convince them to come in. They come running into the office and say, I want to sign. Where's the piece of paper? I say, no, no, read it over first. And they start reading it, and they get to the first, you know, goes through that threshold. There's two paragraphs that talk about the threshold. Then you get to the first, I do or do not want cardiac resuscitation. And they look up at me, and they say, what should I do? I say, hey, you got to talk this to your doctor your about it. Yeah, it's your decision. You need to have medical input. Uh, so I think it's far more important to talk to your, your, your doctor. What if your physician doesn't agree with you? Um, there does, are, this ever, does this ever happen, Sue? Oh, sure. It happens frequently, and it's always happened in health care. We've always had conflicts between what a physician felt was the right course for a patient and what the patient themselves felt. Um, under this particular law, any health care provider has the right to conscientious objection, but they also have the responsibility to ensure that the patient's care is transferred to someone who can uphold their wishes. I think it's important to go back to the paramedic issue real quickly because I don't think we addressed it and it is an important issue and you probably, uh, the exclusion. Yes, pa paramedics are covered. In the, if, if you're found at, at home, if the paramedics come and you're, the paramedics will do everything mm -hmm. unless it's clearly that if they find the, the advanced directive and the doctor who 
is back at the central mm -hmm. station confirms that this is indeed an advanced directive and basically the doctor then has to authorize the paramedics themselves even if they find this piece of paper are not going to say they okay uh, but they will be protected um, we have a caller on line seven go ahead you're on the air hello hi uh we're calling to ask if uh, uh had such a document in hand and the time came to uh, put it into effect if it's possible that something uh, of some activist or even some member of the family might decide, no, that's not the right thing to do, and uh, uh, take it to court on the, is it denying somebody their constitutional rights or, you know, one reason or another, contest this thing and end up in a big legal hassle, uh, which the lawyers would probably enjoy. <laughs> It's <laughs> well, a good question, Bill. Yes, no, if there's going, if there's a family disagreement, if, if say three children support the advance directive and two do not, um, that that's sort of irrelevant. The advance directive under the statute, it has its own validity. That's why the whole purpose of this statute. In the past, you you would have those three children would say yes, two would say no. The doctors threw up their hands. Now they'll they'll be able to say. We know what this person wanted. Right, Bill, but I, I, I can see what, where, where the caller was coming from. You could have a case where, where uh, one child would say, wait, but I know when Dad signed that, he wasn't thinking clearly. He, d he didn't really mean that. Well, the, the statute, though, will, the doctor will have the ability to do things immediately. Right. Instead of in the, in the past, without the statute, if there was disagreement, everybody had to go to court to get a guardian appointed, and then the guardian made that decision. Um, this case, the doctor would have the freedom, not so much the freedom, but would have the responsibility to follow the wishes as best as they're known. Now, you, one important thing is you can always revoke this advanced directive. You can change your mind. You can change your mind in, in any way. If, if, if you're there in the hospital and, and, and you just say no, even if you're, the, the, the statute does not require that you be competent at that point or that you be proven competent. The statute just says if you in any way indicate that your decision is different from what's written, the doctors have to follow that. Another legal question. What if you uh, spend six months of the year living in Pennsylvania and six months living in another state? Do you need two directives? Uh, probably not. The general rule on that is if the document that you signed was valid in the state where you signed it, the jurisdiction where you signed it, then it will be recognized elsewhere. Um, and as each state now does have an advanced directive law, the only difference would be those formalities. Some states might have, want three signatures, some might want it notarized. So as long as you've fulfilled the, the mechanics, which in Pennsylvania, again, is just you sign it in front of two witnesses and those two witnesses sign it, that would be recognized then in other states. Sue, the cost of health care, it's, it's probably the number one thing on many people's minds these days. Do you see advanced directives helping to contain health care costs? I think it has the potential to help contain health care costs. Certainly the, uh, the end of life decisions, and, and it's unfortunate, I wish I'd brought the statistics because there are a lot of studies that prove that about 80% of our health care dollars are spent on people in the last several days of their lives. And certainly by giving people the choice not to extend their lives by, by artificial means, um, we should decrease some of that high tech cost. I don't think that should be the motivation behind signing an advanced directive, though. I, as you mentioned before, I'm a young person and I have an advanced directive. My motivation had nothing to do with the financial burden. What I, motivated you? Wanting to spare my family the agony of making a decision once a crisis had occurred. And that crisis can occur any time. So I wanted to ensure that my husband and my daughters weren't struggling over that decision during a time of grief for them. Right. Uh, the, the, the recent uh, case that had the high profile, the Nancy Cruzan, mm -hmm. uh, that, that received a lot of press. But then there was another one recently, a young woman who, as the result of an accident, became comatose. So it can happen at any time, at, at, uh, at any age. Certainly. Was it difficult for you to make those decisions when you actually sat down to, to fill out these forms? I think you go through a lot of what-ifs. I think it's human nature. To, first of all, it's human nature to um, not want to talk about death. Not we don't want to deal with no. our own mortality. Exactly. And, and so you, you 
struggle with realizing that you are mortal, someday these things may happen to you. You also struggle with the fallibility of other human beings. What if a doctor determines I'm permanently unconscious and he's wrong? I mean, there are all those what ifs that you're going to deal with emotionally. Um, so yeah, in, in a way it was difficult. It was probably easier for me because I've been in this profession for a long time and I hold a personal philosophy that when quality of life is not an achievable goal, we still have the opportunity to provide quality of death. Um, and it's very important to families. Bill, we do not need an attorney, but we really do need to consult our physician before we sign the advance directive. Right? Yes, you definitely do. And, and one thing, if I could add to what Sue says, these advance directives really are acts of love to, the, to our family members because it does. It gives them the guidance they need at, its, at, a, at the most difficult time in their lives. We told you at the beginning of the program this, this wasn't going to be a subject that anybody wants to talk about or think about, but we felt that it was a very important one. And we hope that uh, we've started you thinking and, and maybe uh, discussing the very important subject of advanced directives with other members of your family. This is AgeWise Weekly. We're here every Wednesday night at 8 o'clock. We invite you to join us again next Wednesday. I'm Eleanor Shano. Thank you to my guests, Sue Vera Gibson and Bill Barker. We'll see you next Wednesday night. Have a very pleasant evening. Mm -hmm.